we all have a fundamental human right to our life. That is to say, the right to seek a place where we might be able to preserve and continue our life. Migration is the norm in the history of mankind from the very beginning. Hospitality is one of the foundational relationships between people in all human societies. popular memory and in some older textbooks, the narrative is basically that people were just living in the countryside and not moving much, just working the land. Uh, that's uh, not uh, accurate. Most regions around the world were constantly on the move. So seasonal migration is a very big factor. Also, when we look at uh, indigenous people here in the Americas, they're basically migrating in the plains, uh, but also in the southwest. So migration is the norm. Being on a journey is a very dangerous thing to do. We forget about that today because, you know, everywhere there's going to be a Motel 6 or a Holiday Inn or a, a really nice hotel, um, you almost always know where you can find shelter. But in a world hundreds or thousands of years ago, um, if you were out just on the road in the elements, if it suddenly gets cold, um, you can freeze to death. If suddenly you're left without water or food, you can die that way as well. So the basic idea is that all of us may be a stranger on the road one day. We depend upon others uh, to look after us. This is a millennia-old ethic um, that you're supposed to look after people who are on a voyage. If we go back to very ancient Greek culture, when the dead have to confront the gods to then go on to what we might call a heaven, or be condemned to a hell, they have to give an account of their life. And one of the things that the confessor, this person asking to be led into, let's call it heaven, confesses to is to having given uh, welcoming to the foreigner. And so this is an indication of, of this kind of duty towards the person who was in a dire situation. Every time you have people encountering others who are unfamiliar to them, any time you have somebody coming to a community uh, where they don't know anybody, there is a need for what is often called a ritual of hospitality, whereby an outsider is temporarily incorporated into the community. When you have the idea of a piece of territory with people that belong to it and that have a particular bond to each other, um, the question very quickly turns to, well, uh, who is an outsider? Who is not going to be allowed to be part of it? One of the things that makes a nation state a nation state is the claim to be able to patrol its borders so that deciding who is in and who is out is a basic function of the nation state. The question then is, if you cross a border, can you actually uh, settle at a certain place? In the 19th century, nation states began to define also who is a citizen, who is a stranger. And so a place like Germany didn't have to police its borders because they really began to introduce the requirement for citizens and strangers to register with the police. And that basically people who were stopped by the police and they couldn't prove residency were basically arrested and uh, deported. One of the ways that the United States identified itself and one of the things that the U.S. prided itself on uh, was saying you can go long distances without being asked for your papers, without being asked for a passport. This was contrasted with uh, nations in Europe in the late 18th century where you were constantly being asked who you were and why you had a reason to be there. So at least initially, um, this country prided itself on a certain kind of cosmopolitanism of once you are here, you can go where you want. And of course, this nation had no substantial limitations on, on immigration or naturalization for about the first hundred years of its history. Americans prided themselves on being willing to take all comers. And this lasts really a, until at least the 1840s. It's okay for a government or a nation to want to regulate who comes in and who leaves. But how that regulation is designed really matters and how the process for people seeking to be in the United States matters too. You can have a welcome 
policy and also have a regulation over who comes in and comes out. I think our immigration policy knows how to dial in to the deepest fears that Americans are feeling. The, the risk that I might lose my job if someone else is in my community. They play into the risk that I am not as safe if one more person is present. I think that they play into that fear because it's easy to get support when you play on fear. It's much harder to get support, I think, when you're talking about things like empathy and compassion. We are certainly the model for many countries in the world, or at least have been, um, who look to us as, you know, when people are oppressed or when people are looking for opportunity, um, that is the number one destination for them. And our national symbols, the Statue of Liberty, for example, seem to attest to that. Someone trying to gain access to a country like the United States is often because they are at the end of their rope. They are feeling such a deep sense of hopelessness and are willing to risk everything. So there's this deep sense of vulnerability. If you are seeking a better life, you are already marginalized and you are, are not going to feel like you have a voice. So I think what we need to be doing at a national level, at a political level, is figuring out a way to um, stand in solidarity, to walk with people who are feeling oppressed and marginalized, to make sure that they are not put in an even more vulnerable place in the world. Motility is a fundamental characteristic of human history, of human existence. We could tell the history of philosophy as the history of refugees, of exiles, of people in motion. When we think about the long history of Western philosophy, we cannot dissociate it from the great wars that shaped the West, but also from the displacements that these philosophers themselves have suffered. If we think of the collapse of Byzantium and the collapse of Constantinople to the Turks, which created a mass migration, uh, most of them culminating in Venice, which then created literally the material conditions of possibility for the rise of the Renaissance. There's no Renaissance without the, the incredible number of peoples that were exiled in Venice who brought along with them essentially ancient knowledge that allowed the West to reconnect with Athens. Immigration and emigration are very recent terms. So they really uh, come out of the 19th century. They are related to the distinction between citizens. Uh, citizenship is a product, really, of the American Revolution, of the French Revolution. So people who were subjects in empires or territories become citizens. And as states begin to distinguish between citizens and non-citizens, citizens who are leaving are emigrants. Strangers who are coming into the state are immigrants. We often use concepts that seem normatively neutral to us. In our everyday discourse, we use terms like, you know, citizenship, the state, the nation. But I think that the way we use these words is inevitably loaded and will inevitably have to do with uh, the last few hundred years or so of history. With the rise of nation states, suddenly there are authorities um, who want to track your movements back and forth. We as a nation reserve the right to control the border and decides who passes over and who doesn't. From the foundations of the modern configuration of nation states, borders have become less permeable and a whole infrastructure has developed around them that makes it uh, for human beings more difficult to transverse them. 
the moment you have national borders imposed, then you have national identities. And when you have national identities, now we have sort of uh, citizenship and belonging. The rise of nationalism also sort of saw a rise of certain kinds of xenophobia as the question of who was one of us and who was not became that much more intense. I think that as long as we take national identity to be this very serious thing that we should be proud of, that we should laud, there's always going to be this element of gatekeeping, this tendency to police the people who don't meet certain arbitrary criteria and to treat them as foreign. A new kind of social psychological imperative has emerged within a people, and that is a people then is committed to these borders and, and to some notion that they're threatened if those borders somehow are transverse. This goes by the name of nationalism. Nationalism is this commitment to a conception of the nation, and in particular the nation state, which uh, has a certain kind uh, of borders. And if that is the backbone or the essence of the state, then that necessarily implies that there are people who fall outside of that group who don't share the same understandings of national identity, who perhaps have a very different culture, who participate in very different kinds of behavior. And if there is an outgroup of people, then it seems almost obvious that there would be this desire to prevent that group from infiltrating, from penetrating the border, from coming in and messing things up for the people who are already in there and enjoying this cohesive national identity. The case of Morocco is a very good case to talk about. We're a nation of people who leave, who immigrate. When we were faced with the issue of becoming a country of immigration in the sense that now we are having populations who are coming, that's a very, very interesting shift in our sort of national identity. And so the language that is used in Europe to describe this, this problematic Moroccans is the very language the newspapers in Morocco began to use in references of Saharan Africans, right? They're bringing diseases with them to Morocco. They are dangerous. They are taking away our jobs. That was a very interesting moment for me as a Moroccan and as someone who does research on immigration to suddenly realize the collective experience that Moroccans have abroad as populations who are marked, who are seen as different, who are being racialized and problematized in a, in a particular way, that that experience has not actually protected them from using the same language, reinforcing the same racialized discourse against sub-Saharan Africans. When we think about one of the primary sources of Western identity, we must begin with Homer. Homer gave us perhaps what we can call our first cultural Bible. Homer gave us, on the one hand, the Iliad, and then, obviously, the Odyssey, which is about the experience of exile, of refugee, about xenophilia. Xenophilia means love of the stranger. Right now, I would say we have, both in the con contemporary discourse and also in the philosophical discourse, a very state-centric view of the, the demands of equality and human rights. There's very much a tendency to say that the scope of equality falls only within the state, even though we might have these pretty demanding duties to ensure equality, it's one that's owed only to fellow citizens, that we owe to each other in virtue of our special relationship as co-members of the same state. There's a very shocking amount of global inequality that's just not really coming into the discussion simply because we think that the concern for equality is one that we owe only to our fellow citizens and not to people in other countries, even if they might just be down the road. These ancient practices of welcoming the stranger and offering help 
to someone who is in a terrible situation, who is seeking refuge, get attenuated with the rise of, of the nation state. The nation state now becomes the primary mode for offering help to the stranger. So what actually was a practice of the people gets delegated to the state. With the creation of borders, physical, political, national, linguistic, and racial borders, it becomes much more difficult to exercise what I think is an ethical duty. But that duty now becomes a duty of nations. Leaving one's home is so difficult. Anyone of us who knows family members or others who have left, even when it's really beyond belief what they have to put up with, most people don't leave. The United States really stands out as actually being one of the few countries in the world that has a very open immigration policy that actually makes it possible for people from many countries around the world to actually have a real chance of actually moving here. When we think about the history of the United States and its dark history of relationship with, with Native Americans and the fact that we kept pushing them west, you might say that that was one of the first American uh, refugee crises. Many of Native Americans living in the south or in the west were actually peoples from the northeast. And so it is a refugee crisis, which we created. The issue of refugees is not a new phenomenon. Sore and weary, they wait patiently, anxiously. This mother wonders where she's going to get milk for her baby. This woman wants to know if her little girl will have to sleep in a ditch again tonight. Uh, so obviously for people who are uh, displaced by, by conflict or natural uh, disasters, other uh, factors, they very, very much depend on open borders, but those really don't exist. A refugee at least according to the definitions we use, has some fairly desperate reason to leave, needs to get out of the place where they are, and therefore there should be some help in the United States, in the United Nations, around the world, for people like that to find a safe place to go. British and American Red Cross associations supply them with new clothing. Small wonder if these suffering people had given up hope of ever finding happiness again. The simple definition that's used in the public discourse, especially in political discourse, is in a sense that they are forced to move, so they deserve support. Migrants are people who are looking for better opportunities, and it's really an issue of agency, right? So migrants have agency. Refugees essentially are deprived of agency. They're forced to move. It is very complicated to differentiate between the two. Uh, that's uh, true uh, because uh, the line is very fluid. Refugees do not always have no agency. So refugees are also migrants, and migrants uh, can also be refugees. I think the complexity comes in when you see that depending on who is making that assessment and what their interests are, there may be more confusion or complexity over who, in fact, merits that definition. UNHCR uh, is the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Refugees. One of their main tasks is uh, doing these refugee status determination interviews that allows an asylum seeker to be legally recognized as a refugee who then has some protection under international law. Right now in the Dadaab refugee camps in Kenya that has a population of close to half a million people, the UNHCR office had a system where refugees could text a short message to a number. After a month or so, 
you know, they might find their number posted. Hopefully they'd find out in time. Okay, finally, my number has been posted. I'm gonna spend all morning getting to the UN offices. Inside the UN offices, there would be a space, kind of like what you would find at a bank. And they would have about maybe two to five minutes to sort of present their case. Once it had been determined that, yes, in fact, this person meets the definition of a refugee, they would be given refugee status documentation. And then they have to take their UN document, go to the Kenyan Office of Refugee Affairs, um, be assessed yet again, and then they'll be given um, documentation from the Kenyan government, um, which permits them to live there legally. Bureaucratically, these processes are enormously complicated, and when people then get to the point where they want to, say, access some kind of aid from a humanitarian organization or try to enter a system that would allow them to eventually be resettled to a country that would offer them citizenship, things become even more complex. To a certain extent, it was a little easier in the 19th century. So the United States, in a sense, was open for people who were displaced because it simply had a fairly inclusive immigration policy uh, that made it possible for people who were actually refugees to come in as immigrants, uh, making a case that they were really looking for a better life. And refugee policy, that's obviously something uh, that came much later in the 20th century. We did not have a formal statutory framework for asylum and refugees until 1980, when Congress passed the Refugee Act of 1980. If you are outside the United States and you are seeking refugee protection, you go through something called the Overseas Refugee Program. If you are physically present in the United States, so imagine a student at Penn State who is from Syria who fears return, she will apply for uh, something called asylum. In both cases, whether you're in the U.S. applying for asylum or outside seeking refuge, you must meet the legal definition of a refugee under U.S. law. And a refugee is defined as a person who has suffered persecution in the past or has a well-founded fear of persecution in the future because of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. So you can see we have a pretty narrow definition of refugee, if you compare that to what we might frame as the, you know, moral or broader face of a refugee. Uh, so knowing which process you fall into and also what those restrictions are become important. If you don't have a lawyer and you're seeking asylum in the United States, you have your work cut out for you. The United States has a dismal track record in taking in refugees. Germany took in almost a million Syrian uh, raw refugees. Uh, the United States has taken in, I don't know, a few thousand at most. So the United States is really way behind the curve uh, when it comes to accepting refugees. The Statue of Liberty really has, holds that promise, and the United States holds that promise. Here they can come, and here they are safe. The United States is not living up to that promise uh, right now. There's an international human right to hospitality. This is what refugees claim. Nations have a duty to welcome such people. In addition, I think that nations also have a special duty towards people who are claiming hospitality to offer possibilities, to offer procedures and institutions through which people seeking hospitality can be integrated into that society. 
the best example of this goes back to Immanuel Kant, who in 1795 published a book called Perpetual Peace. In it, he posed a plan to eliminate war and conflict among nations. And one of the requirements that he said had to be satisfied was that there must be a condition of, as he put it, universal hospitality, where everybody has the freedom to uh, walk the earth and to be received in foreign nations uh, without danger to them. So uh, it's really a sense that, that in a world of many different nations and many different peoples, you have to have a means of dealing with those outside precisely to avoid larger dangers of conflict. Pennsylvania's history is one of welcome. William Penn sets up this new space to welcome people who don't have a home. He goes out of his way to include people who are feeling marginalized in other parts of the world. People who've been persecuted, especially for their religious beliefs, like the Quakers, the Mennonites, are offered a home here in this new land to be more welcome, to be more hospitable to the people who are most in need of that. I think it's, it's a part of our origin story in the state, and we don't necessarily always remember that. My Mennonite forebears came here speaking German for the most part. They came here as rural farmers, and they found rural places to farm and to continue to speak German. They were given space to simply continue to be who they were best at being. Uh, rural people, quiet people, people who held on to their ethnic and religious traditions and continue to do so for many years. We understand more about the people that we've been hospitable to than we did before we offered that hospitality. And I think that's how you create a better world, is by understanding stories, by getting some sense of connection with the people who we, who we other or who we keep ourselves distant from. Um, those kinds of things are, are very transformative. Poland was invaded, and the entire eastern half was taken by the Soviet Union, and the entire western half was taken by Germany. So there wasn't a Poland anymore. And some people on both sides of what became an international border chose to flee to the other side. It was a calculation that my chances of survival, my chances of a good life are going to be better on one side or the other. So this initial choice to leave their homes basically means that these people become full-time refugees and they keep getting moved for the next five to seven years or so. As you can imagine, there's a huge variety of responses to these people uh, in the places where they end up settling until the war is over. And some of the ones that come up a lot in their memoirs are the Central Asian people, Uzbeks, Kazakhs, Tajiks, very distant culturally from these rather urban Polish Jews. But there's a lot of beautiful moments um, that Central Asian culture is known for hospitality. In a lot of people describe, you know, getting invited into homes where everyone sits on the floor around a shared pot of dinner and the family life, the patriarchy of it, but also the kind of closeness of it. So there's a certain appreciation of beauty in that culture. They don't speak a language in common, but yet they have this shared ritual language. So there's also some meaningful interactions that take place there. Most Americans, if they trace their lineage back far enough, come from some other part of the world in which they were not welcomed. And they come here seeking a better life. We all once benefited from the hospitality that this land has to offer. Around refugees, I do think the policy is unprecedented. We are looking at the lowest number of refugees um, allowed to be admitted since the history of the Refugee Act of 1980. Contrast that to the Obama administration, where there was a roadmap provided to the public about how a refugee enters and a commitment to increase the number of Syrian refugees allowed into the United States. Many small cities in the U.S. have really benefited from hardworking refugee and immigrant populations, and that's part of our national story. And it shouldn't be forgotten that what we're seeing today in small cities is part of an American heritage. In the 90s, Somalis started arriving in Columbus, and right now there are many refugees from many other parts of Africa and, and elsewhere. 
the refugee uh, communities in that city have, you know, done wonderful things for revitalizing and developing and, and creating this really cosmopolitan sphere. And I think the city of Columbus has really recognized that and celebrated it. So it is a really wonderful success story in many ways. From all sorts of places, they welcomed all the races to settle. I think that hospitality plays an important role in our national story and in our national history. Um, you know, the, the symbol of the Statue of Liberty as a beacon of freedom and of welcome and of hospitality to people in need from around the world, I think is a central symbol of our national culture and our national heritage. I think every person on U.S. soil is important to culture. You know, we sometimes hear the phrase, we are a nation of immigrants. Immigrants really enhance American culture um, and improve it, improve American culture in their own right. But it all comes back to that idea that hospitality is sometimes just taking those first small, simple steps and watching the ripples kind of unfold from that point. have by far the largest population of immigrants in the world. There are about 45 million foreign-born people in the United States. That's close to 14% of the population. The problem with using the word illegal immigrant is that we're not just criminalizing the act, we're criminalizing the whole person. Immigration policy to me seems to be more about controlling populations and the reason for that is there is this discourse of fear that's associated with immigration. My friends, I'm just an average American. But I'm an American American. And some of the things I see in this country of ours make my blood boil. I see people with foreign accents making all the money. I see Negroes holding jobs that belong to me and you. Immigration has a very negative connotation. What's going to become of us real Americans? You'll find it right here in this little pamphlet. The truth about Negroes and foreigners. The narrative about immigration has to absolutely change to challenge this notion that people immigrating to the U.S. are coming to take something. What's missing in that narrative of immigration is the, the, the challenges that immigrants face when they come to the U.S. And I tell you, friends, we'll never be able to call this country our own until it's a country without, without Catholics, without alien foreigners. Previous to the Johnson Reed Act of 1924, um, immigration was largely unregulated as long as it was from Europe. Starting in the early 1880s, a number of restrictive laws were passed, uh, making it impossible for people from China and the rest of Asia ever to become citizens. But with that exception, immigration had been largely um, free. The immigration statute has a lot of history, and one of those histories include the national origin quotas. Um, and it really was a system that discriminated or left out people based on where they are from. In the 19 teens, as large numbers of people arrive from Central Europe, from Southern Europe, the Protestant majority of the United States essentially began to worry. They began to panic that somehow this was going to um, destroy the foundations of their civilization. And some of those objections were on the basis of religion, that the traditionally massive Protestant majority uh, was suddenly going to be dislodged by people who didn't believe the same way. This Anglo-Protestant majority decided to start uh, making laws dramatically restricting immigration. And the 1924 Act and the ones that sort of led up to it attempted to assign quotas based on what the population of the U.S. had been in 1890. 
So that introduces a system that says, again, people from certain countries have a dramatic preference. It really is a struggle about what the nation means. We are the descendants of 40 million people who left other countries, other familiar scenes, to come here to the United States to build a new life, to make a new opportunity for themselves and their children. Starting in 1965, the immigration system in the United States was changed to make it less racially based to make it fairer and without regard to the particular country where people are coming from. Now, the main provision of the 1965 Act um, was to eliminate the 1924 National Origins Act quotas so that everybody would have uh, an equal chance. And that is a great idea, and that was a tremendous achievement. President Kennedy and President Johnson after him wanted to find ways to create equality among Americans where it had not existed before, to create opportunity uh, and to eliminate discrimination and find new ways for the federal government to help people. So if you actually look at um, Johnson's State of the Union speech of 1965, he explicitly says you know, that the Immigration Act is part of this broader plan uh, to bring sort of a, a, a better future to the United States in other lands that are seeking the promise of America through an immigration law based on the work a man can do and not where he was born or how he spells his name. The entire period uh, from, I think, 1924 to 1965, about 86% of arrivals uh, are sort of canceled out by departures. So there's a net gain of only 14% of the total. This is a phenomenon um, that results from what's called labor migration. What would happen in this situation is somebody might send a, a member of their household over to the United States, work for a period of time, send remittances back, and then eventually go back home to live in their community of origin. When we fast forward to the late 1980s, undocumented immigration started to be identified and treated as a problem in the United States, and they started building little sections of wall. So what happened? Uh, people stopped making those return trips. Once they crossed the border, they would stay put. And so what became a circular temporary migration flow became and was turned into a permanent settlement. Which is we have kind of made illegal some kinds of labor that I'd like to see legal. We're doing two things. We're creating a whole society of really honorable, decent, family-loving people that are in violation of the law, and secondly, we're exacerbating relations with Mexico. The, the, the answer to your question... So suddenly, a pattern of settlement that had been very heavily regional becomes national. Since about 1970, roughly 25 million people moved from Latin America into U.S. cities or were born to Latin American immigrants in U.S. cities. It was a, a really dramatic reverse of a process that, you know, we had been worrying about it decade after decade, starting really actually in the 1940s when the term urban crisis was first used. In the 1980s and in the 1990s, remember all those movies, you know, like RoboCop and Escape from New York, where the city was a huge, you know, crime-ridden hellhole and nobody wanted to be there? Well, that era ended, but immigration was a huge contributor to the end of that particular crisis. The question of immigration is really the question of what the nation is going to look like decades from now, and that sometimes arouses certain kinds of fears in people. Again, not just in the present day, not just in the 1960s, not just in the 1920s, but there was the Know Nothing Party of the 1850s, there were the, the Alien and Sedition Acts of the 1790s. This is a recurrent concern that kind of flares up, and at least so far, has always gone away eventually. So I think the first thing we need to do is we need to listen to people who do have concerns about immigration or they may be concerned about their job. But then moving on beyond that is when we start having a bigger conversation about what it is that immigrants bring to our communities and how it is that many of our families, um, if you just go back two or three generations, 
um, also were in that situation in the past. And so I think when we start relating it to our own experiences and we start to see not just the cost, but also the benefits of immigration, um, you know, I think then you get to a place where you can have a, a, a more productive conversation. I think that immigration is complex, and so people are satisfied with a soundbite um, without having or feeling the need to look into the facts. But I do think that once somebody understands the human face behind immigration and the ways in which immigrants touch every part of American life, I think there are so many ways that we can have a valuable conversation about immigration. Give me your tired, your poor. The United States is an incredible place to live. And for much of our history, we have welcomed in people. People in need of a home, people in need of a new beginning. And I think we're still doing that in some ways. My fear is that we forget that history when we think about excluding and keeping others out. We need to remember the words that are on the Statue of Liberty. We need to remember that this is a place for people who have been marginalized, for people who are in need of a new home. We can't let that, that flame go out. We have to hold that up time and time again. When the fear is winning out, I think we have to remind ourselves we are a country that has benefited so deeply from the, the experiences, the journeys that have brought our people to this place. The wretched refuse of your teeming shop.